actually, I think he bought me Starbucks and just lost every amount of commission he ever made for me. <laughs> just saying, because see, I don't, I don't speak a lot. Um, 1 Corinthians 1, 28 is where I'm going to start today. Um, God chose what is low and despised in the world. Things that are not... He cho- okay, God chose what is low and despised in the world. Things that are not to reduce to nothing things that are. So that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom become for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. In order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now, basically what, he, what this is saying is, is uh, God's chosen what people consider foolish. The world seems foolish and shameful and uh, uses, it, uses it to show wisdom. And uh, this part where it says, I'm going to go into 27 because that's, I think, what I meant to get to. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Um, and I was thinking about Palm Sunday, which I think is today, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I've got my palms. Did you bring your palms? Oh, everybody got their palms. <laughs> <laughs> I have to give credit to my wife for that one. When you marry an unchurched woman, that's the jokes. The jokes come out. <laughs> She's like, Palm Sunday? And I was like, no, it's Palm Sunday. Um, <laughs> so, and then I was told her I was going to use it. So there we go. Done and done her. Um, but God using what people consider weak. Now, I often wonder why the church doesn't use that same standard. I've been reading a lot of uh, John Caputo lately, and he has uh, what he calls weak theology. Um, Something that doesn't seem like you'd want to have when you go into an argument against Mark Driscoll or something. You probably want to have strong theology, but no weak theology, a theology that uh, is almost incapable of turning into fundamentalism because it always has a perhaps. And perhaps I'm right, perhaps I'm wrong, but the perhaps is there. And uh, it kind of grasps the idea of what faith is. You know, faith is not the opposite of the doubt. Of doubt. Faith is, is, is of doubt is part of faith. Or, you know, and uh, it's an element of faith. And that's Paul Tillich said that, but I've also said it now. Um, And so I like this idea of a weak theology or an idea of perhaps, it's a scary, scary idea. Um, Even today I was thinking how scary it is to be, decide to be a brutally honest pastor or preacher or speaker or teacher or evangelist, whatever, about your faith. Because my whole life, I think I was taught not to be quite honest about my faith. Um, and not necessarily, not by my parents, but by like just preachers and teachers and stuff that I grew up. Because there was this ideal of perfection that I could never live up to. And that was what you were supposed to put forward. I even remember, um, you know, a pastor telling me not to spend too much time with my congregation. And with people, because you don't, you know, want them to see you for what you are. You know, you need to keep that respect. Us being the man of God. <laughs> and uh, I never really bought into that. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm nervous around people and uh, a uh, introvert. So that's the reason you might not see me a whole lot. Because <laughs> I'm just introverted, not because I think I'm like the man of God or anything. Just like to have panic attacks by myself. Um, you know, and so this false sense of power. And when I was doing this this show last week, yeah, last week I was just very honest about, you know, I said, I don't know if I believe in God half the time. And how scary that is because all of a sudden 
I always try to push myself to be honest. But then all of a sudden, I'm like, people are going to hear that. And people are going to say, oh, well, here's that pastor, and he doesn't know if he even believes in God half the time. You know what I mean? It was like that automatic of like fear that they would smell the weakness or see the weakness in me and pounce. You know? Because I don't have it all together, and I don't have it all figured out, and I'm willing to be honest about it. It's a scary place to be. And it's unfortunate that we don't encourage people to allow their weaknesses to show more. Especially in the church. And because we shouldn't punish people for their weaknesses. That's the problem is when you're constantly punishing people for lack of faith or, or, or just being human. You know, and you, you make being human a weakness. We've, we've created a monster. We've created something that, that you can't live up to. And then we do the very opposite of what we're supposed to do is we're afraid to be honest. So then when we're not honest with others, and especially as teachers, not honest with people, you uh, have a, you raise an impossible standard to meet. So everybody has to live under this ideal that does not exist. And so that is a worry that I have constantly. Um, unfortunately, when you don't have enough people being completely transparent, you come off sounding like a heretic and kind of crazy. <laughs> so, and I guess that's my my lot in life. It's not a lot, but it's my life. That's a quote from Bud's life. Um, um, so Palm Sunday, Matthew 21. I'm going to go with the Matthew version of Palm Sunday. Uh, Matthew 21, 8. Actually, we'll start at 6. Um, the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the, and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road, which would be the palms. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, it's interesting because he, brought, he went in on a donkey, and one is, it, it, this was a fulfillment of prophecy, um, but really a donkey also represents peace, and a colt or a big horse would represent war at the time. So Jesus comes in on a donkey, which represents peace. Um, something that's not, at the time, strength. When they expected the Messiah to come, they expected the Messiah to come and basically overthrow Rome the Roman government. Jesus comes in on a donkey trying to proclaim peace, but is also seen as a threat. And when he is called, uh, this is probably what gets Jesus in trouble. Well, it's not completely what gets Jesus in trouble, but um, when they go, Hosanna in the highest heaven, um, and when they start to say, you know, Hosanna the son of David, blessed in the name when it comes to the name of the Lord, you know, because you know, that was the thing that Caesar would claim as well. So Jesus was causing a little bit of trouble by coming in this way. And in a way, I mean, it was could probably be seen as, as a mockery. Um, or just another person claiming to be the Messiah. But this is where we have this, this, this Palm Sunday. And... Uh, but this is what I find interesting is, is right after that, and I don't know why we call it Palm Sunday and not Temple Clearing Sunday, um, because it says, Then Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling, drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple, and he overturned the tables and the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He said to them, It is written, My house shall not be called a house of prayer. My house shall be called a house of prayer. 
but you have made it into a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he cured them. But when the chief priests and the scribes who saw the amazing things that he did and heard, the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became angry and said to him, Do you hear what they are saying? Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babes you have prepared praise for yourself? He left then and went to the city, to Bethany, and spent the night there. Now, so Jesus, they call it Jesus' Jesus's triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Um, and this is the triumphant entry, is that he comes into the donkey. For a lot of people, this is ceremonially, you know, a great thing. But for me, I think we, we, we miss the idea is that this is the day when he cleared the temple. And this temple clearing Jesus has made a lot of people uncomfortable because people don't want to believe that Jesus got angry or mad. And then there's some people who just love the idea that Jesus got angry and mad and want to think that that's all he was. Um, Neo-Calvinists. Um, <laughs> that was my... Uh, of the little message. Um, and when I think that Jesus just came to kick butt. But what we don't see is, is it's funny is that I think when it says that Jesus, they, Jesus, that they were selling doves, I think there's something interesting here. Because the dove is is a representative of peace and the Holy Spirit. Jesus has just come in on a donkey which is representative peace. And there's this idea of peace. Now, what has happening is the merchants are selling these doves for sacrifice. And they're saying hey, if you buy them here at the temple, they're like twice as much. Like you'll get twice as much out of your bag for your buck. You know, you get a little bit more forgiveness, a little bit more sacrifice. These doves are extra special because they're temple doves. Two temple doves. Um, but they represent peace. So Jesus says no. What happens is, is Jesus uh, all of a sudden does civil disobedience against the religious system of the time. Jesus is saying uh, he loses it because of religion and sacrifices. Uh, there's also a time where Jesus says, you know, I no longer want your sacrifices. Um, I can't remember the verse off the top of my head, so I won't try to. <laughs> he also then starts healing the sick and disabled. But for some reason, Sunday becomes Palm Sunday. What happens is, is they, the moment that gets focused on is the triumphant moment of where Jesus comes and the, the king thing happens, you know, where he proclaims he is the king. But Jesus never really does that. What Jesus does is he comes in and he goes, religion is getting out of hand, the sacrificial system has been taken out of context and out of hand to the point where people are taking advantage of it, and I'm angry. This should be a place of prayer, a place of peace, not a place where people feel guilty and are, are, are told they need to do more sacrifices or pay more for sacrifices in order to have some sort of special thing. And then he heals people. So I guess Jesus healed people enough to not be called Healing Sunday. Um, and I guess it's just not very smart to call it Flipping Out Sunday. Um or civil disobedience Sunday, you know, like go to the Bible bookstore and flip a table over. I just love it. It's a great tradition. It's fun. Um, but what I find is 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 that in the idea of peace, a lot of people see weakness. Uh, in this moment of Jesus riding in on a donkey. Um, and the people, you know, when he gets into Jerusalem, people are all of a sudden saying, oh, he's, the, he's a prophet. You know, before they're like praising the son of David's here. Now all of a sudden he's into the area where this point is supposed to really be made. And they're just saying, oh, here's one of the prophets. And I think that's an interesting way to look at it, too. Um, here's, here's a teacher. Here's someone who, who, who's come to, you know, give us a message. Not necessarily the king of kings or anything like that. There's a, there's a weakness about that. There's a weakness that says... I'm not going to overthrow and set you free from your captives, but what I am going to overthrow is your ideas of religion. That's what I'm here to overthrow. 
your ideas of what the sacrificial system is about, I'm here to overthrow that. Now, I have a different idea on atonement theory. I don't believe by into that God needed a bunch of flesh or anything. But I can tell you the idea of Jesus throwing these tables over and saying, you know, this sacrificial system that you guys are setting up here is wrong is what led to the cross. I mean, this was it. He, you know, pretty much put himself up there, they thought, with Caesar by writing in and doing this, this, uh, this civil, this just riding on the donkey. And he messed up the religious system. And he was a troublemaker, and people didn't want to see trouble. Now, people will argue often, this is where you get into sticky territory, of like, did the Jews kill Jesus, or did Rome kill Jesus? Well, first of all, it would have to be Rome, because Jews had no, the Jewish religion, the Jewish leaders at the time, did not have that type of control over the Roman government. But I think we make a mistake when anybody tries to place the blame on a people type and forget that Jesus was Jewish and his followers were Jewish. What was Jesus killed by? Jesus was killed by religious people and a giant government that said, if these religious people seem uncomfortable enough with this guy, maybe we have a reason to be concerned and rather than be concerned, you know, they just took care of business. They just will we'll crucify him. He'll be showing an example, and the next guy decides to run in on a donkey. We'll think twice about it because he'll hang, you know, and and naked on a cross, and people will come by and be terrified. I mean, that the idea of crosses uh, was to freak you out, um, to teach others a lesson. So on this day, basically, death is coming. You know, so Jesus doesn't try to destroy Rome and declare himself king. Jesus is, he was reforming religion, uh, changing tradition, uh, in the misguided ideas of what God was. Um, when Jesus says, love your enemies, do good to those who persecute you, turn the other cheek, how do you pray? You pray, Abba who art in heaven, and which is more like daddy than father. Um, changing the whole kind of concept of Jesus is all of a sudden eating with different people. Um, rebuking the, the, the experts of the law, uh, of biblical law, and saying, no, we, we've got to see it differently. So we often don't see Jesus as a reformer because we get really caught up in saying, well, the Messiah came, and, and that's important. And I think Jesus was the Messiah. But I also believe Jesus was reforming religion and tradition and came to say, you know, you think I told you to bash the heads of children in and rape women in order to, you know, glorify me. That is not me. That is your understanding of a God that I am not. You know, um, people get really uncomfortable because they want the... Old Testament God and the New Testament God, or Jesus, they have to, like, we've got to line them up perfectly and there's got to be no, like, they, there's got to be no change. And I think the very reason Jesus came and was saying, you've got some of it right, but you got a lot of it wrong. And, and so, if you believe that Jesus is the Messiah and Jesus says, love your enemies and do good to those who persecute you, you might want to rethink some of the things that, you, that were said in the, before that. If you look at, the, if you use Jesus as the lens of the Bible, you're going to find issues that people are getting off track, old and new covenant. Um, Jesus, in a way, is saying weakness is the new way. You know, no more sacrifices. Love has come to town. If you believe in atonement, then you believe that Jesus was the last sacrifice anyway. And it's funny because it's usually people who believe very strong in atonement theory and the sacrifice theory quite undersell it as a good sacrifice. The Son of God died for your sins. 
But there's a special prayer that you need to say, and there's a special way you need to live, and a special choice you need to make. Well, all of a sudden, that doesn't really sound like there was much of a sacrifice made to atone anything. It was just something that happened so I could make a decision. Wouldn't I have been better off before? Uh, but, you know, because Paul says, you know, God was being entirely fair, but he did not punish those who sinned in former times. So, what do I do with that? So, I would we go as far as say, if I'm wrong about, and I'm very well could be wrong about the whole sacrificial system and, and Jesus just being something that they understood at the time, uh, then Jesus would ultimately be enough. <laughs> Period. Um, but we like to add things to that. If Jesus wasn't that, I think Jesus was saying, what's important is love. Faith expressing itself through love. Um... Christ had been abandoned by what would be considered the church at the time and the state. Now I want to look at the weakness of Christ. I know that I've said a lot of weird things just now about philosophy and theology as far as atonement theory and things like that. And that's not really my focus today, but unfortunately something that's got to be covered is we talk about this a little bit. Um, but this is the moment, the day that Jesus is, really seals the deal of what's going to happen to him. Um, He's just made too many enemies at this point. Um, and not trying to overthrow government, but trying to be a reformer. Now, it seems like there's a lot of contradictions in these last moments of Christ's life, because you have like this, the triumphant ent entry to Jerusalem, which is actually just the title that Bible people, Bible companies put above there. And traditions that we've had. And I mean, I remember when I was a kid back at my parents' church, thousands of people having palms and waving them in the air, you know. And then they would do something with the palms. I don't remember exactly what they did with the palms. I've never been a, the pastor who loves to like preach the holiday sermon. Like today is this day, and so I'm going to talk about it. You know, it's like too easy or something. It's like you know. And I was like, Am I, I'm not going to talk about the palms today. But then something struck me about the weakness of this idea of this of Jesus on a donkey. And almost the absurdity of it. And how it almost like seems like this huge contradiction coming in. Of course, he comes in on this animal that represents more peace to these folks. And then goes and turns over tables because they're selling something that represents peace in a moment that's not very peaceful. I mean, there seems to be a few contradictions here, and that's okay because, you know, life is full of those kind of weird, strange little contradictions. Um, unfortunately, we're afraid that if that happens in this thing, somehow it messes it up. For me, it just represents life more. So, in my mind, is we have someone who says, I've, I've, I've come to bring priests. I've, I've come to literally turn religion on its head. I've, I've come to, uh, you know, this idea of fulfilling the law, the idea of, of, of the law is turned upside down, and it all becomes about love God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself, and all of a sudden those are equally as important. Um, you have someone like the Apostle Paul saying the greatest things are faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of this is love. So even Paul saying... Love is beyond even faith and hope. Um, in 1 John, you have it said that God is love. You know, so you get these really amazing statements uh, that are happening. And uh, love and, and walking an extra mile isn't much against a spear or a sword. Um, loving your enemies uh, often doesn't get you rewarded. So... There's this sort of power in this weakness of, uh, in, in nonviolence. If you watch uh, things of, of Martin Luther King, or even if you just watch the, movie, the Gandhi movie, and, and you see these scenes of people being stand in line, just being beaten in the heads, 
with sticks and then like people waiting on the side to take care of them. You know, this is saying this is love. Go get beat by these people and go get hurt by these people. Uh, you know, it's not like, hey, you know, let's get together and kick some ass. You know, um, mission accomplished. You know what I mean? It's like you're gonna kind of be walked all over in order to show them that they're messed, that they that they have a they've missed it. It's a weak idea, not a great idea, but it is an idea that I believe can change the world. Um, but it's funny to me is how what we call Christianity today has grown out of this man's life, this Jesus, this odd rabbi's life who tells wild stories and goes on a mountain and doesn't tell us how to be saved. It just tells us how to, you know, blessed are the peacemakers. You know, blessed who those are more. You know, you get this odd character and we've created what we have now as this big church system from this guy's, this odd character's life. And that's why I think Reformation is continuously important. You know, how have we created creeds from this guy's life? We have creeds and we live by them or we separate by them or they, this is what, I follow the Apostles' Creed, so this is the right creed and I do not follow your creed or I have this creed and this creed and we study these creeds and we take these creeds very seriously. But I'm seeing a man who's like continuously getting us back to the basics of love or he's looking at the religious teachers saying it would be better that a millstone was tied around your neck and you thrown in the water than if you hurt one of these children. You know, this is the kind of stuff you got this guy saying. But we get, we've built creeds and giant buildings um, from this example. We've built, uh, we have built temples to this radical man named Jesus. A man who didn't have a place to lay his head, a man who could barely keep any followers. Like you would like, what happened to all these people who were like Hosea the day? I mean, like just a week later, there there's nobody there. A week later, they're like, oh, he got arrested and he's getting the hell beaten out of him and he's getting crucified. Oops, made a mistake, followed the wrong guy. You know, who's next? Yeah, give us a thing. Yeah, we'll take Barabbas, please, because this guy is obviously not the Messiah and we're tired of having false hopes. It almost seems like Jesus was like just a letdown to most people. And this is what we build a power structure out of. This is where we go, like, we've got to have ideas in our church like IBM, or we've got to run it the best, and they've got to be big, and they've got to be put together well. And, and, you know, we've got to get together with the government and make sure that they, people follow our convictions and that marriage is a sacred thing, and then we have this and we have that, you know. And it's all these huge contradictions to this man's Jesus' life. And it's very obviously their contradictions. Now, I will sit in a room with people who have great, part of great denominations and great things like this, and they will say, Jay, but how can you say this? And I guess, well, I just say it. It just comes out of my mouth. It's, just, it's an observation, and I just, I'm so tired, and, and when you're beat up enough from this system, you just start to realize, like, I can't play the game anymore. You know, it just... It's a big waste of time, and a lot of people are being hurt, and a lot of people are suffering because we're playing this damn game with each other. And like, well, let's go over the creed, and let's dissect it, and let's talk about all the philosophies of them, the theologies, and everything else behind it. And I'm going like, yeah, okay, it's okay, but let's just talk about the guy's life. Let's see if this, you know, is this, was this the point? I mean, so much of this was, what we have as a church today was, you know, put together by people who were not thinking of Jesus, but they were thinking of how to rule governments. So when we build walls and demand sacrifices in his name, I think we miss it. I think we miss the point. So when Paul says uh, God has chosen things that seem idiot to the world, often we think that that means, um, or weak, well, often we think that that means that somehow our our morals seem weak to the world because we want everyone to live the way we live. You know, I mean, there's such a way to reverse and turn around, but no, he's saying, you know, 
to confine, using what the weak confounds the wise is saying, you know, loving people is going to con- make the wise person go, oh, it's going to rub on their bones a little bit, you know what I mean? It's like when the end of the debate of philosophy or theology, and you go, I chose love, it's going to rattle you a little bit. Um, it's hard to do because we all want to sort of have a lead or control on the situation that it's either through wisdom or through might or through some sort of uh, cleverness. And then you've got this guy, Jesus, who half the time won't even give you a solid answer. will give you a question with a question. And say, oh yeah, sure, that's important. You know what you're doing there is important, but don't forget the most important thing is faith expressing itself through love. You know, so like I was like, you know, he's not saying you have to throw out the tithing, but he's saying, yeah, that's great, that's important. I see your guys' point, but you're also, but you're missing the more important thing, and that's loving people and caring about people. It's not about success. Jesus was a failure. Jesus was killed. You know, you can say, but then three days later. But I'm not getting into the three days later. And even the three days later wasn't that revolutionary. Most people thought, here's a guy who a bunch of people pretended like their master came back to life. I mean, the three witnesses, uh, most of the witnesses are women, which wouldn't even hold up in court at the time. So it wasn't like this great planned out deal even then. It was just Jesus' life lived. A life less lived, a life that wasn't built on success or creeds, or great buildings, but something that was based on somehow the suffering have their rewards. Somehow the meek inherit the earth. You know, all of a sudden the peacemaker is the one who's blessed, not those who can overthrow governments. Weakness is something to be embraced. And maybe the idea that weakness is what we think is weakness has always been the strength. But we'd always, you know, Jesus came and said, listen, the strength that you think I have of you wiping out people and killing people and taking over nations in my name, this is, maybe that's, you know, the, he has to use the word weakness now because that was really weakness, but what we think is weakness and we think is strength. And so he just said, okay, well, then, you know, what you're seeing as weakness is that's what you need. <laughs> Keep your weakness, because this force and idea of strength is not who I am. So, perhaps I've got it right, perhaps I don't. I hope I do. I'm going to try. I'm going to guess that I don't have most of it right anyway. But to me, that's what this day represents. Is weakness, peace, contradiction, and a man whose life has been misunderstood and misused quite a bit. And, uh, but for some naive reason, I don't think it's too late to try to grasp a better meaning and a better idea and uh, change and reform things in the name of love, compassion, uh, patience, kindness, <laughs> joy, and those type of things. So. Have a palm someday. <laughs> 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 I could have done the whole like palm crucified thing, but I'm not gonna do that. Um, yeah, so that's all I got for you. I don't have a pretty bow, but I hope that you know it's challenging the hell out of me. It's making me really nervous lately because it's all I want to talk about and all I want to say. And I hope we can do it and do it with each other and just say, yeah, I'm not gonna play games. I'm just too tired. And people will give you some really compelling arguments and they'll have awesome degrees and lots of really cool books and lots of really awesome words and big buildings, big buildings oh. and maybe even some nice cars, but it's just, you know, you just don't, don't, let, don't let fear rule your life. And a matter of fact, let your love for them and they're, you know, helping them see something new maybe change them. You gotta learn to love those folks and say, 
I love you enough to say that I think we totally got this wrong and that we've been having the wrong conversation for almost 2,000 years and we need to rethink this.